Hey everyone, welcome to the Plant Powered Cyclist YouTube channel. I'm Andy. Today I'm going to take you to Georgia on my 10 day cycling trip in about 10 minutes. So there will be happy cows, dancing dogs, and amazing insects. I hope you enjoy. After cycling for nearly 3 months in Turkey, these were my totals. Now it's time to start a new country, Georgia. After crossing the border, I only had a few hours of sunlight left in the day. It's crazy how you can cross a border and everything changes. During those few hours, I experienced a new alphabet that looks really easy, a new currency, and no more mosques. Also, people tend to dress much more liberally here. I never saw the hijab again. The owner of this place said this is my beach. You can camp here, no problem. I'd only ask him for water and he offered me a camp spot, so I took it and I even made a friend. Unfortunately, like in Turkey, not many people speak English, so conversation was limited. I took a quick stroll around Batumi, but realized that I'd much rather be in the mountains. Doing the daily chore, drying out the tents, I have some visitors. One will be amazed by the amount of historical stone bridges that Georgia has to offer, with most dating back to the 12th century during the reign of Tamar the Great. The fact that they are still standing after enduring earthquakes and floods really shows how well engineered the Georgians were. I also came across a few waterfalls on my journey. The great thing about waterfalls is that you will usually find locals selling food. Hey, we're gonna try a typical Georgia food, church kayla. Uh, it's comprised of walnuts tied to a string, and then it's dipped into a hot grape juice, where it solidifies and turns into this magical looking type of food. <laughs> so we're gonna give it a try. That's good. That's really good. Oh man. So here you gotta try this one. Ahora mismo lo voy a probar. We have a visitor. As you can see, the Georgian roads aren't as highly engineered as their bridges. As I made my way to the top of the Goderzi Pass at 2,025 meters, I saw a sign for Green Lake and decided to make it my camp spot for the night. These wooden houses are owned by mountain farmers who call themselves Memtevri. They share their wooden houses with their cattle. The traditional two-story house comprises an upper floor for the people where you have a room for processing and keeping dairy products with holes in the walls for air circulation. The lower floor is used for livestock. Here I thought there were cabins for skiers and snowboarders to rent during winter. When I got to Green Lake, I met a bunch of cool guys who spoke zero English, but tried their best to include me in their group. Some of them got in the lake and went for a swim, which at the time I had no plans of doing because it was cold. I was glad I didn't go for a swim because I found out that both usable and non-functional weapons were dumped into the lake after military exercises. They said if one walks on the bottom of the lake, the weapons could reach up to their knees. The government knows about this. If they're not willing to remove the weaponry, they should at least put up a sign or caution us that, oh, by the way, there might be a sudden explosion. The 
origin of the Zarzman Monastery is attributed to a famous monk of the 6th and 7th centuries, Serapion Zarzmeli. The ruler of this region, Giorgi Ciorcianelli, helped him establish the monastery by making a significant donation of villages and estates. However, today's buildings from his time do not remain because it was abandoned when the Ottomans came in during the 16th century. Repairs and reconstruction began in the early 20th century. Currently, it is the home to a community of Georgian monks. Hey, I think that's enough. <laughs> this medieval structure in Akhaltsiki, Georgia dates back to the 13th century and comes from the word Rabat in Arabic which means a fortified place. Rabati Castle has seen a fair amount of invasions and destructions in the past. It was destroyed by the army of Tamerlane in the 13th century and then again by the Mongolians a hundred years later. After that, the Ottoman army came in and ruled the land for centuries. They completely rebuilt it and added a mosque. With a failed attempt by the Russians in 1810, they would ultimately receive the palace after the Russo-Turkish War in 1829. After that, the castle lost its importance and slowly fell to ruin. A renovated Rabati castle was opened in August of 2012 to draw more tourism. If you didn't book ahead, don't worry, these people will come looking for you. I got offered 30 lorries for one night and I made this face. It immediately dropped to 20, and as I biked away, it dropped to 15. However, I didn't want to pay 15 lives. I went outside the city and I found a camp spot. Come on, come here. Can I bet you? Kurbitsi Fortress was built on a rocky ridge at the confluence of two rivers, the Paravani and the Kura. It is one of the oldest fortresses in Georgia, but the exact date is unknown. In the 10th and 11th centuries, it was the center of the Mesketi area, and in the 12th century became a town. It shares a lot of the same history as previously said at Rabati, destroyed by Mongols, taken over by the Ottoman Empire, and ultimately given to Russia after the Russo-Turkish War. The castle hosts a five-sided watchtower, a square keep, the St. George Church, which has an inscription that dates it back to roughly 985. The tower and a portion of the walls date back to around 1354 from an inscription found above the fortress entrance. There are also two tunnels that go down to the river. One was used for water delivery and the other is a communication system. Wow! Check out that sexy cyclist! I knew I could count on these guys to guard my tents while I went to check out Vartsia. Vartsia got its name from Queen Tamar, the great female monarch of Georgia from 1184 to 1213. Legend has it that she went out hunting, got lost in the caves, and when called for she said, I am here uncle, which in Georgian is Ak Vartsia. Queen Tamar was actually the first woman ever crowned as a king in Georgian history. Varti was built during the 12th and 13th centuries during the reign of George III and his daughter Tamara to protect Georgians from Mongol attacks. There was only one entrance to the city and it was through a secret tunnel starting at the Makvari River. There were three secret passageways so Georgian soldiers could defeat enemies by surprise attacks. This cave complex hosted temples, monasteries, baths, libraries, houses, a water system, and so much more. However, only 100 years after it was made, it suffered a devastating earthquake that destroyed two-thirds of the city. It went from over 6,000 rooms to about 600. Some historians believe that Queen Tamara was buried here. In order to confuse vandals, eight funeral processions went in different directions simultaneously from Tbilisi. They arrived in Gelati and in Varzia. Hey, are you my little friend? Yeah, you are. You wanna dance? I'll dance with you. After a farewell dance and a hug goodbye, I had one more pass to go over before I would be smooth sailing to the Armenian border. I don't know why, but I had this urge to go inside of this church just to see what was inside. And as you can see, there wasn't much inside. Akakalaki Fortress was probably built at the same time as the town, in 1064. 
The only remains left today are bits and pieces of a castle, a mosque, now used as a shelter for cattle, and a caravanserai. This family took me in as one of their own. The guy seemed shocked that I didn't eat dairy products, and even more shocked when I turned down vodka at dinner. Was he expecting a different answer when he offered it to me for breakfast? One apology is better than none. This far, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, like it, share it, and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you guys next video.